So my dad is a surgeon, my mom's a nurse, and they met in Chicago because they were both here for um, work visas. My brother's a doctor, I'm a doctor, my brother's a general surgeon, and we kind of followed that whole physicians in the family. Dr. Alan Adahar is the son of Mario and Adelaida Adahar. He has one brother, Mark Allen. My dad's from Batangas, my mom's from Tagig. They came here to Chicago. So I'm first generation. I grew up in Skokie, went to high school in Chicago. I went to college at, in California, Santa Clara. And then I went and studied medicine at UST. But you couldn't speak Tagalog. How no. was that experience? It was horrible. It was horrible. I thought I could. But then when I got to the Philippines, my classmates are speaking Tagalog and I was completely lost. But, you know, everybody in the Philippines is very accommodating. I came out with really good friends. I met my wife in the Philippines and she's here in the States with me now. And she's actually my practice manager. Being a doctor in the U.S., uh, could you tell us some of the challenges that you have to overcome? Being a phil -Am initially was hard. They have this idea about, you know, you being foreign. but. Luckily, there was a lot of good doctors from the Philippines that paved the way for us here. Like everybody knew doctors from UP and UST. You know, I said I went to UST and surprisingly, there were a lot of nurses and other doctors that said, oh, I know UST. Me being so young is an issue because, you know, when I give lectures for this technique, even lectures to a bunch of older American guys, I go up there and they say, you look like a kid. I should be teaching you. And then I give my video presentation and then they understand and then they respect me. I don't notice any like limitations because I'm Filipino, but when I take off the lab coat and then I walk in the hospital, that's when I feel it. Like, it's not res there's not as much respect. You know, that feeling where you get kind of judged before opening your mouth, that's when I feel it, when I'm not a, in the doctor mode, How which is sad. Generations before us have taught us that, you know, you just have to show them and prove to them that, you know, we're educated, we know what we're talking about, and, you know, respect us because we know what we're doing and we'll be taking care of you. Dr. Alan Adahar, a proud graduate of medicine from the University of Santo Tomas or USD in the Philippines, is one of the pioneers of minimally invasive or mini laparoscopic gynecologic surgery in the United States. He is the founder of the Illinois Institute of Gynecology and Advanced Pelvic Surgery. I wanted to do orthopedic surgery when I was growing up, but I, uh, you know, I wanted to be like a carpenter of the body. That's what my dream was. And then I did two years of general surgery, and I felt like focusing just on pelvic surgery. I did two years of general surgery followed by ob residency and then a fellowship in robotics. After my fellowship came back to Chicago, I was employed uh, through a hospital system doing general ob for three years. And then two years ago, I went on my own just to do this minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. So what um, motivated you to get into the microsurgery uh, field? My fellowship was 99% robotic surgery. So robotic surgery consists of this $2 million robot. You put five instruments in, so an eight millimeter incision here and then just in the abdomen, and then you sit at a console and you operate, you know, using 3D glasses. And it's a great idea, and the instruments are wristed, but it's a lot of cost to the patient, a lot of cost to the healthcare system, and there's only one robot, so I would have to wait a month or two in advance before being able to book that surgery. And I saw that there was no difference between a robot surgery and traditional laparoscopy. So I switched and abandoned the robot completely. But then at the hospital that I was doing my laparoscopy at, there was no assistants that were qualified to help me because I started a laparoscopic, I guess, program there from scratch. So I took the robot, some of the techniques I used for the robot of like placement of instruments and incorporated in my traditional laparoscopy and I kind of reconfigured instrument placement. I started using these three millimeter instruments, three millimeter camera in 2014. Nobody else was using it at that time and technology wasn't even fairly adequate to make it doable. The HD quality of the camera systems we were using, it was good enough, but it wasn't perfect. Now technology is finally picking up and catching up to 
the surgery that I'm doing. And now I'm a surgical consultant for multiple surgical device companies that are now only this year starting to develop microlaparoscopic instrumentation. Let's go into the patient's um, perspective. What are the benefits of this minimally invasive? Why would you recommend it uh, versus the okay. traditional surgery? The incisions don't hurt very much. You take Tylenol and ibuprofen for pain and I do these local nerve blocks mm -hmm. and patients go home the next morning. They don't use narcotics. 95% of my patients, I've eliminated narcotics completely after a hysterectomy. This instruments and your camera, it is just as effective? Inside, it's the same surgery. Right. On the outside, it's not. Six weeks of rest is necessary, but you won't feel the pain. Blood loss is less, risk of infections is less, mm -hmm. hernias is less, recovery is faster. All the benefits in the world to do this instead of an open procedure. Adhesion, scar tissue inside is less. Narcotic use is almost eliminated, which is a big issue with nowadays. We have a lot of women watching. They would love to hear what would be the reasons for women to see a gynecologist like you. Uterine cancer is a big deal, but if you catch it early enough, it can be treated with surgery alone, and bleeding is the first sign. So any bleeding after menopause needs to be evaluated immediately because surgery can cure you. If you have multiple family members that have breast cancer or breast and ovarian cancer, you need to talk to your doctor about genetic testing because there's genetic tests available now that can help determine whether you're at an increased risk or your risk is the same as general population. And then heavy menstrual bleeding, fibroids, and chronic pelvic pain. There are medications that I use to stop hormones that can stimulate pain, and it helps me differentiate if your pain is from a herniated disc, if it's from intestinal issues, or if it's from a gynae problem. And if it is from a gynae problem, then we can address it with medications or surgery. What about those who are under 25? If you're less than 25 and you've got severe pain with your periods, being on a birth control can slow the progression of endometriosis and is recommended until you're ready to have kids because endometriosis can cause infertility also. So endometriosis is a tricky, tricky disease because eventually if it's pain is severe enough, people start labeling you as a drug seeker because they don't believe your pain anymore. But the pain is real and it's just not being managed appropriately. I want to go back a little bit to the Filipino-American side of your being brought up as a first-generation Philam. So how Filipino is your family? I feel like I'm Filipino blood and Filipino pride. And I go to the Philippines and people say, oh, you're an American. I said, no, I'm Filipino. But I don't speak Tagalog, I eat Dinuguan and Balut, I do. but. Um, you know, that's kind of relative because if you look at the generations of Filipinos here now, like second generation, and you know, we all identify ourselves as being Filipino, but you know, it's kind of relative because even Filipinos in the Philippines might not consider somebody who moved to the States Filipino anymore. But I think it's just a matter of Filipino pride and being, you know, involved with the Filipino community that really determines, I guess, how involved you are in your Filipino root. Kind of adapting to American medicine is one of the hardest challenges that I think all foreign medical graduates from the Philippines face. You know, you just have to, like any profession, you have to just immerse yourself completely in it, fall in love with your career and be passionate about it. And once you decide on the career you choose, you have to focus on perfecting kind of your craft, right? And, you know, as long as you're chasing what you're passionate about, the success always follows. And, you know, you never chase money. You just kind of chase what makes you happy. And then you know, everything else kind of falls into place. For Philam Now, this is Rome Rock and Nichols, Chicago.